Good afternoon, Whitewater. You're listening to 91.7 The Edge at WSU Whitewater. I'm Joe Maurer, and I will be your host for the next hour that is dedicated to the fourth and final radio broadcast that will be conducted by myself of the Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project. The Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project is a statewide multi-UW campus community collaboration project founded in 2012 at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, a rural campus between Madison and Milwaukee. The project uses the collection of stories and recorded interviews known in the academic world as oral histories to engage rural and urban communities alike in conversations about farming and food production, especially as they relate to race and ethnicity, cultural roots, and the history of this great state. To date, five UW campuses, UW-Madison, Milwaukee, Oshkosh, Eau Claire, and Whitewater, and over 250 students and faculty have together collected over 300 oral histories. This collection includes stories from Wisconsin residents and families representing communities of Hmong, African American, European, Hispanic, and Native American descent. Last time on the show, which was exactly two weeks ago today, I interviewed my friend and colleague Ken Verdon about his experience working with the Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project, and today I am joined by Mr. Alan Marshall of the Whitewater area. He is a local farmer as well as the as well as the vice president of the Whitewater Historical Society. Mr. Marshall, thank you for joining us here today. My pleasure to be here and talk with you about the Oral History Project. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Also, before we get started with the interview just a note to any of the listeners out there that might be interested in calling in we would ask you to please refrain from calling the radio station during the interview we if you would like to um, make a call to the station about um, in regard to a question about the radio show or a or a comment to myself or ken um, please refrain from doing it after the show is done thank you for your cooperation with that So, getting to the interview now, Mr. Marshall, um, let's start with some basics. So, you are a local, you're a local farmer, and can you tell the audience where your farm is located? Uh, The farm is located north of Whitewater in uh, Cold Spring Township. Okay. It's about three and a half miles north of uh, Whitewater out on Fremont Street. Okay, excellent. And you said that um, when we have talked prior that you were actually born and raised in that in, on that farm, correct? That is correct. Yeah, I was born there uh, about 1940, so Excellent. I guess it gives my age away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I lived there until I was, uh, stayed there until I was 25 years old. Excellent. And uh, while I was there, I attended uh, well, at that time Wisconsin State Teachers College, Whitewater oh, here. In, UW White, at yeah. UW Whitewater. Right, and Excellent. I graduated from there. Excellent, excellent. What um what year did you graduate from at UW Whitewater? Uh, sixty five, I think. Nineteen sixty five, and you yeah. graduated with education degree, correct? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, social studies, broad field of social studies, okay. and a Phi Ed minor at that time. Oh, okay, excellent. And uh, I tried to get a, a a job, but it was at the mid semester in January, and there was. Uh, 75 people with the same uh, degree in one mm-hmm. thing or another in education. And I went down to the placement office to look at the placings of jobs. And uh, to my surprise, there was only three jobs. Oh, geez. So I thought, well, that's not really going to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that. So anyway, from there, I uh, decided that I would go back and, and start working towards a, a special education license. Okay. And so I, I got the. Uh, like 15 credits uh, towards a um, master's degree in special education. Oh, excellent! And did you re- and did you receive your master's degree? No, I did not. Okay. I, uh, I stopped because of working conditions and okay, some, excellent. Some monetary oh, problems of course. too, of, but of course, yeah. of course. Excellent. And then I got away from it, so I never really went back. I mean, because yeah. the job I had didn't really require it. It was a mm-hmm. residential treatment center. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's the type of a job where that they want you to have the education and so forth, but you don't really need to have the degree. Yeah, of course. And you are still a uh, resident. You are still working at this resident treatment center today, correct? That is correct. Why don't, why don't you explain to the audience what that is? Okay. The, the residential treatment center is for uh, students. It's a boys uh, center uh, for the students who have become in contact with the law or have been expelled from schools, and uh, the schools have tried all other uh, avenues of uh, education programming, and it has not worked. 
and the county social services and also uh, we get court ordered kids and uh, we do have some that uh, juvenile uh, delinquent kids from the state that are taking uh, part in our program. Uh, we're licensed for 72 kids and right now we've got as of uh, Wednesday when I left uh, we had uh, 52 kids. Uh, that varies so much because some go AWOL and then we get some that are discharged and we okay. get new kids in. So on any given day, the uh, enrollment can vary, whatever. Of course, of so course. So we have no idea really, but as of I course. said on that Wednesday, it was 52 kids. <clears throat> of course, of course. Well, thank you so much. And for I just work there part-time now. I'm semi-retired, but okay. I, I work three days a week. So. And what do you teach at this? Uh, I teach there? science, and okay. this semester it's biology, and last semester I taught physical science. Oh, okay. So I've done all the fields in physical science. Oh, excellent, excellent. What um, what made you get into science, um, even though you had the broad social studies degree from the university? Uh, the, the thing that really got me into it was uh, I've got a produce uh, business that I run and grow the crops, the vegetable crops on the farm, the home farm, and the pl growing of plants and all the different uh, companies, that the seed companies, all the different uh, variations they come out with, with their breeding and uh, the disease control. And I don't know, I just got interested in plants, uh, okay. the, the growing of plants and the particular science of plants. So mm -hmm. that kind of led me to the biology end of it and the genetics of it right. and so forth. Right. So the big getting back to the <clears throat> farming aspect, it was really the farming that really had a big impact on your um, interest in teaching science to the youth. Yes, that is correct, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, getting back to the farming then now, um, you said it was located, your farm is located in the Cold Springs Township. How long has that farm been in your family? Uh, that has been close to 100 years. Really? I, I think it's like 88 years right now. Really? Okay. Uh, my daughter uh, lives on the farm now, and they brought it from my uh, mother. Okay. And they've been living there since then. So Wow, that's that that is that is a yeah, long time. Yeah. So uh it's been about 88 years somewhere in that area. Yeah, I don't know for crazy. sure. But did your family build the farm or did they uh, purchase it? They, they, was it purchased by a distant relative of yours? Uh a distant relative, uh it would be my grandfather. Okay. It was Faye Robert Marshall that bought it. And then uh my dad bought it from him. Oh, okay. So Excellent. it's been in the, those many years, it's been in the Marshall family. Excellent. Well, thank you for, thank you for explaining that to us. Um, getting back to the, uh, the heritage of the farm, do you know what um, particular descent that your family comes from or um, how your family would have came over to Wisconsin, this Wisconsin area? Uh, the heritage of the family, mostly German. German, okay. Uh, my dad was uh, in English, but my uh, mother was German. Okay. And that, and so it's kind of a, a mixture. Uh, I don't really know how they settled here, but uh, uh, my f relatives, aunts, uncles, uh, and great aunt and uncles, and that they lived in Milwaukee area for quite a while, and I think they came over uh, as immigrants on an English boat, but I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, I've done some research, and there is indications of that. Okay. But oh. uh, they've been around for in Milwaukee area for quite a while. Okay, yeah, big, definitely a big German heritage mm -hmm. in this part of Wisconsin. So, yeah. excellent. Well, thank you so much for explaining that to us. Um, can you explain to the audience, to give them a view, what, um, what um, did you harvest on the farm? Livestock, um, plant, or crops? What, 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 what did you harvest on the farm? Yeah. Uh, or, what, or what do you currently harvest still too? Well, I can tell you what, when we were farming it, what we harvested in that, uh, it's an 80 acre farm okay. in, in Cold Spring, and we raised uh, the crops. Uh, the crops were um, alfalfa and Timothy hay for the, the cows. And, and then we also raised oats, which was kind of a seeding crop for the alfalfa to get okay. started, and corn. Those were the basic uh, crops that we grew in that and, and the corn and that was used for feed for the animals and so forth and uh, as far as the animals at the time when uh, growing up we had hogs and we had some chickens and we had uh, 12 to 15 milk cows and then we had about 10 uh, 
young stock, uh, young calves or heifers that would be ready to give bread and to milk later on. And uh, today, uh, the, the major part of the farm is rented out to a neighbor that farms it, and he grows uh, soybeans and uh, hay, alfalfa and timothy, and uh, corn on it, but mostly uh, hay, and, and that does... Uh, it, the soil and so forth is just more conductive to using uh, hay. Oh, yeah, of course. And, that, and then I raise vegetables on uh, about 20 acres. Now I've cut back a little bit, and the vegetables uh, that I raise uh, consist of sweet corn and beans, uh, pumpkins, various varieties of pumpkins, from large pumpkins to real small ones. And, of course, now there's white pumpkins, and there's some pumpkins that are a mixture of white and yellow, so... You raise that and about seven different varieties of squash. Oh, okay. Wow. wow. Uh, the squash, uh, winter squash. I don't raise any summer. It's winter squash. And okay. It's all the different varieties. The main ones are the acorn squash, the butternut, the buttercup, and um, the carnival now are the main ones. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, wow. so plenty, plenty of crops to choose from then and a lot, oh, of, yeah. a lot of variety on your farm. Excellent. Uh, an interesting note probably on that is that I did raise muskmelons and watermelons for uh, quite a while, oh, uh, but uh, it's not too far from the uh, Bark River there. And uh, the uh, Sandhill Cranes would and when I first started raising the vegetables, mm-hmm. there was only about four or five of them. Yeah. But now there was, you go out there and there's flocks of them. Oh, wow. And there's you know, 25 and 30 I've counted at one time. And what happened is they started picking into the melons and uh, get the juice for, oh, for okay. water and so forth. So once the skin of the watermelon or muskmelon is broken, mm-hmm. it rots. Oh. So okay. it just... Got to the point it wasn't worth it. <laughs> oh, right. Had to stop that eventually. Yeah, but now the squash, they don't bother because, well, there's no moisture, really. But also the skin is a lot harder. Too, oh, than, yeah, of course. And that's so, yeah, that's just... Those pesky cranes and everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they're protected. You can't do anything with them. Oh, of course, too. It's it's not, yeah, they're the state conservation, DNR, they're, they're protected. So. Oh, yeah, they're very protected. And um, uh, what was I going to say, too? Oh, yeah, I remember um, growing up. Growing up at home, I know we didn't have a particular problem with cranes, but I know my my parents would garden, and we had a lot of problems with deer. I know getting into the getting into the various plants yeah. that we were gardening. So, and I'm sure you've experienced something like that too. Yeah, uh, deer have really not been a problem until uh, they, they'll eat the leaves off on the beans. But the, by that time, the plants are pretty well done anyway. Okay. But anyway, uh, this last year was the first time I experienced some problems with the deer and pumpkins. I had some, oh, about 30 nice big pumpkins in the 40 to 50 pound range and nicely shaped, round, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I went out there and I thought, well, I'm not going to pick them yet. They can stay another week or two weeks and they'll be Mm -hmm. all right. And that, because the longer they get more uh, color to them and and stronger, keep longer. Yes. Well, I finally went out about a week later and here 10 of them had been chewed in by the deer. Oh. So I harvested them all that day. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get what I could, because they were some really nice pumpkins. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. you had to so, get, get them out of there as fast as you can. Yeah. Then. <laughs> well, you know, wildlife is part of it. That's just one of the things you got to put up with. Oh, right, and, right. And different controls and so forth. Oh, right, and there's really nothing you can do about it either. No, it's just... no. Well, I put the, uh, what they call scario eyes out, which is a big round balloon with uh, different designs on it you put on it. It blows in the wind and stuff. And oh, scares, okay. It's supposed to scare them away. Has it worked so far? Uh, it, it did, yeah, okay. after I found out that they had done it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> had to take action immediately then. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's other things you can do, too. they got uh, guns out you can go to that shoot like guns to keep stuff away. Oh, yeah, for sure. And you, the problem there is I uh, had a neighbor that milked cows, and that would scare the cows, so oh, we had to discontinue okay. that. So so I can't put you can't take firearm action <laughs> no, or anything? No, you can't do that. With, <laughs> I mean, you know. Oh, well, oh, well. Well, I hope it gets better for you in the future. Well, then. it's not, you know, it's just one of those things. I mean, you live mm-hmm. with it. you got to work with it. Oh, yes, of course. And yeah. I'm sure, yeah, being your experience of the farming, you you know exactly how yeah. that goes. And just, I'm, yeah, certainly you've had to deal with it in the past. So, yeah, so. Of course. Um, well, getting back, um, that, that was a not-so-favorite thing about the farm. Let's talk about favorite things about working on the farm. Can you tell us, the audience members, um, 
Can you tell us like what your favorite thing about working on the farm is or was? Um, some fond memories you have about working on the farm? Well, um, the favorite thing I liked to do was obviously field work because you could drive the tractor. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't, you know, that hard. And you, you had the equipment, the plow, the disc, the planters, and that. Uh, you could do that. What I disliked the most was milking. Uh, not so much that you had to do it, but when you had to do it, you had to do it every day. We did it in the morning and at night. And so I had to get up early and help with the chores in the morning before I went to school. And then I, uh, at school, I was only allowed to go out for uh, one sport, and I chose football mm -hmm. because otherwise uh, I needed on the farm to work, on the mm -hmm. farm. So my parents said the one sport. Uh, and the other problem was that a lot of my cousins lived in the city. So on the holidays or family get-togethers, um, we'd all be enjoying it and one thing or another, and then come probably around 4 o'clock or something, my dad would say, well, we got to go milk, the, get ready to go milk the cows. And so uh, my brother and myself and my dad, we'd go out and have to do the milking and that. And my uh, cousins in the city, they'd stay there and do the fun things, and that way we had to go back and do the work. Oh, and that. of course. So yeah. I didn't appreciate that too much. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I there was hard work on the hay and that when you were in the hay mow and it was, you know, temperatures 80, mm -hmm. 90 degrees out and up in the hay mow there's not much wind so you don't get much protection from right. that. So it was hard work doing that, but I enjoyed that too. But the field work was the main one. Oh, excellent. Okay. And uh, I worked with uh, the livestock. I enjoyed that. And I had... Uh, a 4 H project of uh, dairy. I had uh, two milking cows and two heifers I would show. Oh, okay. And uh, I like working with uh, the animals through that. And uh, one of the cows uh, at the, was at the Jefferson County Fair, was where I, I showed it. Uh, one of the cows I sold to uh, years back, it was uh, Piper Brothers out of Watertown. And uh, it was a purebred Holstein, and it was a, a nice, uh, it took uh, first place in its category. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, asked if I wanted to sell it, and uh, they was going to go to Argentina. They were, really? Yeah, they were buying, they had a buyer, and they'd go around to the state and find cows for that buyer. Really? In different countries and that. So wow. Mona, which was the name of the uh, animal, went to uh, Argentina. Oh, so one of your cows you raised went all the way to Argentina. Yeah, I must be proud of. Well, it must be a bittersweet moment too, because you took, yeah, taking, it was taking care yeah. of her for so long, and then suddenly, right. yeah, has to yeah, go to Argentina. But, but that's also all part of the farming end of it. Oh, I right. Mean, like when the cows, when they got to the point where they weren't really producing milk, well, they went to uh, they shipped them to the uh, Milwaukee stockyards. Oh yeah, and that. So I mean, you know, you, you get used to that. That. It's you get a little bond with them, but then it also you have to break that bond at the end. Oh you're... right, just about business too. Yeah, just about just about part of the farming lifestyle. That so. is, yeah. The same way with the pigs when they got ready for market, you you ship them. You got you know just. Oh right, of course. Too, so. Do you have any fond memories about selling livestock to market, or that come to mind when we talk about this? Well, I I think it was all kind of interesting because. Uh, like with the cows, when they got ready, they weren't producing uh, the milk that they should be doing and so forth. And we had a uh, young stock was ready to replace a particular cow or something. You'd have to call a, a livestock person, that, a trucker. And uh, basically, uh, Don Jacobs Trucking did it. And then they would go into Milwaukee. And in Milwaukee, there'd be different uh, uh, people uh, that would buy the animals, and then uh, Holmes and Robinson Company was one, and then uh, that's where you'd get your check from. But then they would turn around and sell it to the meatpacking company. So it was kind of interesting that whole the whole process that whole process yeah. what happened back then. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for explaining that to us. That's very interesting. It's, yeah, so. didn't, I did not know that. It's it's interesting how that whole system works. Yeah, we'd all get the check for, and most generally it was Holmes and Robinson that would buy it. There were some other meat, uh, uh, people in there, middlemen, so to speak, in that, but never knew where the cow or the pig went, went to. Oh, right, for sure. You just yeah, took that, it to market. So. Yeah, that was the market, yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned earlier 
um, something about 4-H. Do you still work with the 4? You mentioned that you were part, part of 4-H, and that's how you got to raising livestock. Um, are you still part of 4-H? Do you still... Um... No, I'm not uh, involved in 4-H anymore. Okay. Uh, I was involved. I had a dairy project, and then I did some, uh, like, um, corn, a field crop uh, category for a little while, not very long. But uh, and then I did have uh, my three grand, uh, well, two granddaughters and one grandson uh, took part in it for quite a while until just recently, uh, two years ago was the last time my grandson did anything. But my one granddaughter is still showing at the fair. She uh, chose uh, was a turkey, I guess, this year. Yeah, she's going to show a turkey oh, and really? some uh, chickens, and she has a steer. Oh, okay. So, and uh, my mother back then in the 4-H, she was a, a leader for cooking. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's sort of like this is just sort of like a family tradition that you're carrying along. Yeah. It must be yeah. very proud of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the uh, Cold Spring 4-H Club. So. Oh, excellent. Uh, is the How how large is the uh, Cold Spring 4-H Club? I am not quite sure how large, okay. but it's a lot larger than when I was there because now they've expanded when I was there, you could just kind of like in your t uh, certain area or school area, you could become part of it. But now they, uh, it's in Cold Spring, but they go to Sullivan. They get people from Sullivan in there. So okay. I think it was like 47 or something like that. Okay. Members okay. now. And they got more projects or different too now. I mean, uh, you can, Legos. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a project you can build with Legos. Really? That's part of it now. I did not know that, that you could do that. On... And uh, uh, target shooting. You know, like trap shooting. Tra and, and all oh, that. Okay, kind of, okay. Yeah. So they, not only is there an agricultural aspect, there's more like a sportsman aspect yeah. to it now, too. I think okay. they expanded that to attract uh, more members because oh, eventually right. the farms, you know, disappeared. And, oh, of course. You have and, to adapt and, to the change. Right. And so, therefore, the membership would go down at oh, one time it was down to like i think it was like 12 or 12 15 people at one time oh, but now yeah. that they expanded the area and mm -hmm. more uh activities or more projects why mm -hmm. it, it helps a lot of course yeah it's yeah. just unreal you go to the fair now and all the activities there are i know it's it's i'm sure it's insane wow well, definitely definitely have to check that out sometime that yeah. is interesting thank you for explaining that to us um did you now we there we know that 4-H is a very big agricultural um, organization in schools. Did you ever take part in an organization called FFA, Future Farmers of America, in school? Yes, I did when I was in high school at okay. uh, Whitewater High School. Um, I four years of it. Okay, uh, I became a vice president of it, and at that time I was with dairy and uh, took part in meat judging. Oh, okay, and also speaking. Oh, okay. And uh, I had a, what was that? No, I'm sorry, that was a 4-H. I did speaking in 4-H too. Oh, okay. And I, in 4-H, I had to do the speaking, and I won the local contest and the regional contest. I didn't win the state, though, but I came in second. <laughs> uh, but uh, I had to give a major speech to the Wisconsin Canning Association at that time. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so I've been involved in the 4-H at that, and also the FFA and office and uh, the different projects and, and okay. crops too crops oh. dairy and uh some speaking there for ffa excellent what did you speak about in the particular speaking um competitions i talked on soil um the makeup of soil and uh how to prevent the erosion and uh okay. making good use of the soil oh okay okay so applying the nutrients to the soil and the, okay. and, and the different pr practices of plowing uh, like on a hill okay. contour plowing and stuff mm -hmm. like that excellent well it seems like you had a very well-rounded diverse area of um expertise in these organizations and yes, that translate over into the farming community i enjoyed it all oh, excellent well thank yeah. you um do you remember now you talk about how 4-h and, and organizations like ffa how they sh it shaped um, you and your personality. Do you remember any other institutions that shaped your community as a whole um, when growing up in Cold Spring? Um, institutions, you know, schools, um, religious organizations, businesses, or anything similar to that? Well, uh, uh, religion has uh, helped a lot, shaped a lot. Uh, not agriculture per se, but I did think it uh, helped a little bit in terms of how to... Uh, 
appreciate nature better and uh, work with it and so forth. And uh, it just made, uh, I think, a better person because of that, uh, the religious background. Okay. Do you, you the, the religious background, the, or just the religious institutions in the Cold Spring Township, you mean? Oh, be the city of Whitewater. The city of Whitewater. Yeah, the church, I, uh, First English Lutheran member. Um, I, th I think it's helped. Uh, it helps you to uh, appreciate, uh, I think, uh, animals too. I mean, in, okay. in, a, in a sense, more than they're not just a, an item or a, something like that. Yeah. Of course, so like it's it taught you, and so you you treat them different than you. And back then too, you, it was, as I said, twelve to fifteen milk cows. Mm. Uh, you could work with them a lot better than today oh, when you got uh, five thousand cows on the farm. Oh, I mean, of course, you know, of course. That's you know, and the way it is, it's changed you know, for different reasons, and they get good care too. But you don't, they don't get that personal care. That I mean that. I think that through the church that helped oh, yeah. develop that. Of course, it was like so it was a small, the small farming community on top of the uh, the sort of egalitarian message of the church that mm -hmm. sh that helped shape you and your farm. It that helped you in your perspective on farming. Right. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for telling us about that. That's that's really it's very interesting. It's interesting how the religious institutions how they affect. Of the, how they affect the farming community yeah. and you in general, so, or you in particularly. So. Um, getting back, you mentioned before there, you mentioned just a couple minutes ago that, um, it's, it was hard to, it's hard to take care of cows today or because, or some cows on farms because there's like 5,000 cows versus back, um, when you were farming, there would be, you know, you know, 12 to 15 cows. Um, do you see that that generally translates, um, to, you know, um, this large sort of transition to large production farming and large factory farming that we've seen in the past decade. Um, do you see that as a good step in the farming community or a bad step? Um, or what do you see for the farming community in general, especially here in Wisconsin, which is so agriculturally based? Correct. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I Most of the time I think it's kind of bad, but yet, okay. you know, uh, it's it's good too. Um, I think the bad part comes about in that uh, you're affecting the environment, uh, the rural area, with uh, handling of the manure and so forth, uh, liquid, and then spreading it, and and that, and the whales, the water whales, uh, uh, using all the water and that and so forth. Um, I, I think those are two areas that are could affect the environment eventually down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. Uh, out in Cold Spring, there's a farmer out there that, that uh, irrigates and draws a lot of water okay. for that large acreage mm -hmm. and that. So, And then also uh, around there, uh, houses are being built, and there again, more uh, water is being used and can affect the groundwater table. Mm -hmm. And there's a sod farm out there that uses it, uh, quite a lot of acres. Uh, so, I mean, those are things I think that's uh, water table. Uh, it might become a problem down the road with the larger farms I mean, mm -hmm. and the more people too. Right. And that, um, as far as uh, handling of the cows, I, I don't think the personal part is there, like I said before, but I do think they uh, basically they probably get just as good a care as when we did the small farming. Uh, most of those places have a, a veterinarian on duty all the time. Okay. And whereas we didn't, we'd have to call the veterinarian. And, oh, right, of course. And maybe he'd get there that day if it wasn't an emergency or something. But they got their veterinarians, and they uh, got the people that milk the cows, so they milk them all, like, and it's a lot easier. So I don't know. I think the, those are all good points, uh, and they do take pretty good care of the cows. I mean, a lot of people think they don't, but they do. Uh, they use sand for bedding instead of straw, so uh, then they can reserve, you know, reuse that uh, sand they shift it through and, and reuse it mm -hmm. whereas with straw you use it once and then it goes back out for the fertilizer on the field so there are some good points to it but i think overall i think it's something we really got to become concerned about watch what's happening right for sure yeah it was <clears throat> it definitely it could be it could be used for good purposes but definitely something to keep watching and not yeah. to not play to get too out of control excellent um, well, thank you so much for sharing your views on that. Um, we talk of quite a bit on this show. Um, we talked in the, the past several shows about 
Um, not only has there been this rise in factory-based farming, but there's also been a, another rise that's taken hold really in the last like five years, I would say, and it's this call back to um, uh, like farmers markets and community-based farming. Um, have you experienced this increase in demand for like farmers markets and more locally um, locally based food? Uh, yes, I think there's been a tremendous increase in that. Okay. Uh, I, uh, my vegetables and that I sell at the uh, Whitewater Farmers Market, and uh, we'll give them a plug. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and uh, I put Winchester True Value on Saturdays there. And I've noticed that the, the vendors are it's increased, but also the customer base has really increased on that too. Oh, of course. And people are uh, wanting to know, uh, is it organic or do you use pesticides, insecticides, and fungicides and that? And uh, I say, well, yeah, to an extent, but I don't just go and spray and all that. So right. I think people are looking out for that, too. Right. Whereas in your larger farms, uh, they do a lot of that, the, the chemical stuff. Of course. To um, protect, uh, and like that. And so I think there's been that increase. And now there's, in Whitewater, there's the city market for vendors, too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our vendors at the Saturday farmer's market sell there on, on uh, Tuesday down at the city market. So, and that works out good for the vendors because they can sell on Saturday and then what they, they can get ready for the Tuesday market because you don't, all your crops don't come exactly at one particular time and you can mm -hmm. harvest them and sell them and that's it. Mm -hmm. they're, they're spread out in different times. And then they got Saturday to sell, so that helps out. And both markets have, have been increased in terms of, uh, of people in that. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, um, why do you believe there has been this increase in, um, like, a market base for the, like, locally made um, foods or foods with, that don't use insecticides or pesticides or fungicides, as you mentioned? Well, I think one thing is people think it's a lot more safer. And, you know, studies keep coming out to show that this can happen with all, some certain chemicals. You can get certain diseases, cancer or what. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that, but I think another main point is that it's fresh. Okay. It's like, okay, with my sweet corn, I, I pick it uh, Saturday morning at, well, early, as soon as it's light out. Mm -hmm. And at 8 o'clock, well, before that, actually about 7.30, between 8 o'clock, I'm down there selling. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty fresh. Mm -hmm. Whereas you go to a store and you buy it, you don't know how long it's been of course. You know, uh, what people don't realize, too, is that particularly like with sweet corn, in the wintertime, some of that is just as good as what you get in Wisconsin in the summer. Oh, yes. Because it's grown in Florida, so it's chipped up, but it's bred with uh, sugar enhancers and so forth mm -hmm. so that the sugar doesn't get out of it and mm -hmm. you don't lose that sugar. But people, I think, generally think that it's fresher, and it is, during the summer and that, mm -hmm. so... They get the fresh, and they think it's safe, and mm -hmm. they get to know the person that's selling it too. I think mm -hmm. that's important. They can talk and better quality, better food quality, overall. and they can tell. You can tell people will ask you questions. Well, how do you grow this and stuff like that? So you can answer that. So there's that cooperation between the vendor and the customer. That sense of community again yeah. sort of reinforces that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you are the vice president of the Whitewater Historical Society. Right. And um, my question to you is, how has being the vice president of the Whitewater Historical Society influenced your beliefs and your practices on farming? Well, one thing is that, as I stated earlier in the interview, I, my history, danger was in history of broad fields. So I was interested in history. And... Um, as I grew older and so forth, I became more interested in local history. Okay. And uh, so I started collecting stuff from Whitewater. And uh, collecting the stuff in Whitewater, I saw the different, uh, the transform of Whitewater from an industrial type uh, uh, community mm -hmm. in which they had the Esterly Harvest Works and the Winchester Partledge uh, Wagon Works and stuff like that to an agricultural uh from that and uh, that kind of piqued my interest there and then I got like the feed mills I remember uh, the stone mill uh, feed mill in downtown Whitewater my dad would uh, he had a trailer behind his uh, car would throw the corn and the oats in and we take it down there and grind it oh, they would okay. grind it for the cow feed 
Okay. And there was other uh, feed uh, uh, around uh, that, but uh, that kind of got me interested in uh, the crops and so forth and, and involved in the, uh, the history part of it. You could see the companies that dealt with this product and mm -hmm. how they did it okay. and, and so forth. And that became interesting to me too. Right, for sure. Okay. You well, know, yeah. Full. And now those companies are gone and there's not, uh, there's a different type of manufacturing and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so that, uh, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing your uh, experience with that. I appreciate it. Um, um, and one question I have for you is, um, what do you believe it means to be a farmer, in well, your opinion? Yeah. Uh, I guess what it means to be a farmer is one thing is that uh, you have to be concerned about what the customer wants whether that be animal related or whether it be crop related. And you have to make sure that the crop is safe and so forth. But I also uh, think it means that you have to uh, be involved in the community with people and, and so forth. So I think it's a little bit beyond just the farming end of it. You okay. have to be more involved with things in, in the past, I think, the way it is today. Okay, okay. Well. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Thank you for sharing about that. Um, with that being said, um, is um, there's an old creed that says, you know, like when you're when there's an old creed, you know, um, that says like when you when you become something, you're that for the rest of your life. Do you believe that when someone farms, they're always a farm? Like when someone's a farmer, they're always a farmer. Do you believe in a creed like that, or I uh, basically do. Okay. I mean, um, I can use myself. I mean, that's what's happened there of growing course. up on the farm and then uh, going to school and getting a degree in a different field, but still having roots on the farm uh, with the produce and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. now I still do that. My uh, granddaughter and her husband take or own the farm and that. And I think that's a, a lot of that is uh, happening. But on the other hand, I think that's diminishing a little bit because of the economy uh, the way farms are, you can't uh, really make a living off from it in a sense individually. You got to be big, mm -hmm. and, and they can't afford that. So they got the well, the grandkids or the sons and that of farm families. They would go and get jobs in the community mm -hmm. and support it and so forth. So they got away from the farming. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They just it's so. Uh, so, so I don't think there's as much of that now, but I believe that th that that's a true uh, statement. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, on the subject of what it means to be a farmer, though, um, and we talked a little earlier uh, about um, like massive factory farming. Um, do you believe someone who, let's say, runs a massive farm production but doesn't actually work in the fields or get like their hands dirty or anything? Um, do you believe that they're considered a farmer, or are they more? Like, um, are they more a businessman? Um, what What do you believe is your opi opinion on that? I think that uh, they're more of a businessman okay. than, than a farmer. Okay. Uh, and, and they're more concerned with the profit end of it. Right. That way, I mean, uh, they don't want to lose money, but they want to make money, so they make adjustments based on that. And uh, because of commodity prices always low most of the time, right. uh, sometimes they get higher, they have to make adjustments for that. And so they watch a lot of that rather than the actual uh, field work and so forth. They have people under them that would be doing that. Of course. And so the, the people that own it or the corporations that own it, I think it's more of a business type uh, setup. Okay. And as I said, they're more concerned with the profit, which I know growing up on the farm, we were concerned with the profit too, but, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but we still did the work in the fields, right? Exactly. Like you have to. There has to be sort of like a, a work end to it, and get your get your get your hands dirty and get in um, involved with the product that you're actually selling yeah. and making a product a profit off of. So okay. Yeah, and nowadays with the large amount of like, well, some of these farms like five thousand cows and stuff like that, uh, and all the milking around clock and that, mm -hmm. uh, you can't be involved in all that. Mm -hmm. it just of course, of course. You just, there's not enough time in the day, just, right? So you have to delegate that, and right. It just gets it's it's too big sometimes. Yeah, of course, you know. of course. So well, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, what about someone who 
is a working class person, like they work on a farm, but they don't particularly own a farm. Would you call them, would you refer to them as a farmer? Um, we're, I'm just curious. I would call him a farmer because, uh, well, if it's a um, crop area, then they're working with that crop. Okay. They're, they're growing that crop. They're harvesting, planting it, and so forth. So they're working with that, and that's part of farming and that. And if it's the animal end of it, uh, on a smaller scale, uh, they're working with those animals, whether it's milk cows or milking them or feeding them and taking care of them. So that that's all farming. So I would call, classify them as farmers. Okay, excellent. Okay. Based on that information, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, this, so more the the farmer working in the fields who doesn't own the farm is more of a farmer than the actual uh, business person owning the 5,000, who owns the, the 5,000 heads of cattle or something like that? Yes, that is correct. I okay. think that there, there's that big difference there. Of course. Now, whether, you know, it's right or wrong, I don't know that, but it, it's that's the difference. Right. And it's your personal opinion. That's, and yeah. that's yeah, that's what matters. So thank right. you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um in closing, I have one last question left for you. In closing, um, what is the best advice you can give to people who want to become farmers in the future? Well, I think the, the best advice is that you need to have a financial uh, awareness, uh, a financial background of this. It's changed so much, like with the, uh, the comedy uh, market and uh, so forth. So I think you need a financial background, and you have to be a good decision maker, okay. and uh, uh, a good uh, mechanic. I think those are the three main things, because if a machine breaks down and you can't make a, a easy repair, a simple repair on it, and you have to have somebody come and do it or take it to the uh, equipment company, it costs you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the main thing there. And financially, as I said, the commodity market, uh, you got to watch that. And that takes a lot of time. And you got to understand it when to sell your uh, corn or grain or anything like that. So that's important. And you got to keep records, production records, which would kind of, of animals, that would kind of fit under the financial. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the, the three main uh, areas that the, you got, if you've got those and, and want to go into farming, I think you can do it. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, we're always going to need farmers, oh, yeah. especially with the rise in the local-based farming that we talked about earlier. They're definitely going to need more farmers in the future. Then, yeah, it's 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 really interesting how that trend has shifted from to the local-based farming. Yeah, and I'm sure it's very nice for you, though. So, oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, there's uh, that's the growing thing of the uh, United States is farm markets. Oh, of course. Uh, farm markets and uh, sustainable agriculture, where you subscribe to. Uh, produce a person to provide so much uh, vegetables per week. Oh, yes. Pounds, if it's 20 pounds or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. all those are growing aspect of uh, agriculture in Wisconsin and the United States. Mm -hmm. Of course. And, that, and there's a lot of farmers markets. Just about every town or around this area has mm -hmm. a, a I market. Know. Mm -hmm. I know my uh, my hometown Portage. They have a farmers market. I know from the spring to the fall, and it's it's always wonderful to go down there and check out local produce and yeah. local local markets and stuff like that. So, well, thank you. And on the subject of farmers markets, you mentioned earlier. I didn't 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 give you an opportunity to plug the farmers market so much, but <laughs> as a last bit here, why don't you plug the farmers mar the Whitewater Farmers Market while you're on air here? Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity. Of course. Uh, the Whitewater Farmers Market is open every Saturday. I, I think we're starting April 30th of this year at the Winchester True Value parking lot on the west side of town, just across from Culver's there. And um, it's uh, you have to grow your own stuff. Uh, we don't allow people to come in and resell. You have to grow your own stuff. And uh, if it's arts and crafts, which we do allow, you have to make the arts and crafts. You can't buy a wholesale and come in and resell and like mm -hmm. that. So we want it. Uh, part of it is uh, local. Uh, whether you make the arts and crafts or grow the vegetables or the, the decorative flowers or like that, it all has to be grown. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for plugging that, and and I'll make sure to be going, paying a couple visits to uh to okay. the farmers market come the time. And 
Um, yeah, I want to thank you for be joining us today, Mr. Marshall. This has been a wonderful conversation. I hope it's been wonderful for you. And um, yeah, just thank you for your so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it, and I know the audience does as well. So well, thank I thank you. you for the opportunity and to give my perspective on the agriculture, how it's going and so forth. And I, I think that, you know, agriculture, as you said, too, is going to be important and continue to be important in our society. Oh, very, very much so. Very in much different so. Different aspects, but it will become important. Very much so. And it will forever, forever be changing and adopting to the change in society. So, right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, for those of you listening right now, you have listened to this will be my fourth and final broadcast for the semester of the Wisconsin Farms um the, the Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project radio show, and I know my colleague Ken. He will be um, having one. He will be having one show next week, I believe. Is that correct, Ken? And uh, he'll be having one show next week, and then I think he will be done for the semester. Then, but I want to thank all of you out there for listening these past couple weeks to us and to myself. I greatly appreciate it. And again, if you are interested in the organization and want to hear more about it, it is the Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project. It is located here at UW, our headquarters is here at UW-Whitewater. And you can contact myself, Joseph Maurer, Maurer spelled M-A-U-R-E-R, on the campus, on the UW Whitewater directory um, page on the internet and also you can contact our professor whose name is James Levy. He is a history a professor of history here at the university and Levy is spelled L-E-V-Y and I know you will be able to find his contact info on the directory page online if you go and check him out. Once again you're listening to 91.7 The Edge at WSU Whitewater. Thank you so much for your time, everybody, and have a good day and have a good week. This is Joe Maurer signing out.